All right, so this session, we are going to talk about um, the vocation plan. This is um, kind of a summary of the plan here, this, this uh, page that you got on your seats. And we're going to talk about this because this morning, as you recall, was more kind of spiritual preparation and some education. And now come some of the practicalities, the real life stuff the diocese has planned and hopefully you will join in with. Now, why, why have a plan? You know, ever since I was a little kid, I was very impatient with blue skyers. You know, people that were always daydreaming about things. I had my friend, Sean Rankin. He would always be like, man, when I grow up, I'm going to have a big house. It's going to have a Coke machine in it and a pool table and a bowling alley. And I was like, dude, I think Miss Dinsmore will pay us 15 bucks to mow her lawn. Let's do that first. <laughs> you know, I was always kind of like the guy of action, right? But the truth is, the truth is, you have to have both, right? You have to have some vision, but then you have to have some execution, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about today or this afternoon. Okay, goals of the vocation plan. Um, one is just very, very broad. Um, help all Catholics to see that their vocation is the path to holiness and happiness. Right? God has made us in a certain way for himself, and our vocation is like the path to get there. Okay? Um, the second is kind of multifold that every young person in the diocese understands each vocation as a minimum, is invited and inspired to actually consider these vocations, is equipped, knows how to listen deeply for God's call, he kind of has a spiritual, some spiritual muscles to do that. And he is accompanied as they discern. So it has a, a community of folks, as Father Pratt talked about, a community of people to do that. So we're going to go over four elements of the vocation plan, prayer, education, discernment, and inspiration, and we're going to do this in a non-boring way, okay? Okay, promises, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I really want to acknowledge, first of all, though, that everyone in this room plays a different role, okay? Therefore, some elements of this plan are going to be more applicable to you than others, right? But nonetheless, I still think that it's good for the kindergarten faith formation teacher to know what's happening at the college, okay? So we're all in this together. This is a shared mission. Um, we're going to go over these quickly. Um, the, only, the only aspect that we're going to spend some significant amount of time on is uh, education when we talk about the vocation curriculum. But, but hang in there. We're going to do this non-boring way. Okay. First aspect of the plan is prayer. And we're very deliberate in this plan to keeping things realistic, not blue skying. Okay. So there's only three parts to the prayer. The first is um, the bishop, as you know, has written this new vocation prayer. That's what we open uh, the whole vocation summit with. And beginning this Sunday, we're asking all parishes to pray this at Sunday Mass. Every parish has already received prayer cards and stickers that they're going to put in the pews or you know, in the inside of the hymnal. And so that's supposed to happen this Sunday, August 7th shared with the priest last night, my own, the diocese I grew up in, Savannah, Georgia, we have a vocation prayer that we have prayed for 45 years. Every single parishioner knows it by heart like the Hail Mary. Honestly, start saying the first words of that, everybody just chimes right in. So the idea is unity. Let's ask the Lord, you guys, from the bottom of our hearts, send your grace into the hearts of our young people, right? That's that's the, the, the idea behind this prayer. And I want to say this. If you go to Mass this Sunday and your priest doesn't pray the prayer, gently remind him that the bishop asked him to do so. 
Gently. Gently. He might just be a week late. That's okay. Okay. Second thing is the Vocation Crucifix program. You may have seen on the back table, there's actually two examples of the Vocation Crucifix. Um, these are in all the schools already. Um, and we want to remind you and invite you to begin this program this fall in the schools, but also perhaps in your parish. And this is what it entails. For the classrooms, this little crucifix travels to from the kindergarten class one week, first grade class next week, second grade class next week. And when it comes to your class, you have this little booklet. And there's a prayer for every day of the week. Right? It also comes with these little prayer cards, this nice little rhyming vocation prayer that's more suitable for younger kids. Okay? Um, so the schools already have this crucifix kit. We're inviting other parishes to adopt this. Do you all remember these vocation chalice programs that used to happen? Okay, Same exact idea. A different family brings this home each week and prays for vocations in their home. If you already have a chalice program going, just keep that, obviously, okay? This is, frankly, it's easier to get crucifixes than chalices, to be honest, okay? So that's why it's the, the traveling ch uh, crucifix program. Okay. The third prayer initiative, holy hours for vocations. I think everyone in this room probably already knows this, that there is a very close connection between Eucharistic devotion and vocations. It's undeniable at this point. The, the CARA study um, that uh, happens every year of newly ordained priests, they ask how many of you regularly engage in Eucharistic adoration before seminary? It's like 75% of guys. So, now, that's kind of holy hour to pray about my vocation. This is, we're asking parishes to do holy hour for vocations, like an intercession for vocations. And there's even going to be a booklet on this, which is, it used to be right here. There's samples on the back table intercession for vocations. You'll hear more about this. The four dates that are proposed, um, these are, you don't have to do it on these dates, but these dates make sense. Priesthood Sunday, that would be right around the corner, right? September 24th, uh, World Day of Prayer for Consecrated Life, World Day of Prayer for Vocations, Feast of the Sacred Heart, which is also the feast of the, I think it's sanctification of priests. It's the same day. World Day of Prayer for Sanctification of Priests is June 16th. So those are, so what does a holy hour for vocations look like at your parish? Let me make an important point here is this does not have to come from the pastor per se. In some, sometimes it's better if you as a parish group Organize this and ask your pastor to help facilitate it, okay? So don't only wait for your pastor to say, hey, we're doing this. You guys do it, okay? You guys do it and ask him to be there and facilitate, okay? Sometimes, obviously, the priest is going to tell you you're going to do it, okay? But, but just be aware of that. And the other point I would say with the holy hours is... Invite a group that already exists in your parish to be like the main host or something. Like it could be the Knights of Columbus, could be a, a woman's group, um, some group that already exists. That way you already have a bunch of people, you know, that makes sense to be there. But then, of course, invite everybody. And just to tell you, th this little booklet is neat because it has some reflections. Um, that are applicable to your life too, <laughs> you know? Like you'll grow also in this holy hour. It's not just for someone else, it's for you too. It's for you too. Okay, so those are the three 
discrete prayer initiatives. These are not the only ways you can pray for vocations, but they're the three in the plan. Okay, now we're going to get into education, and this is probably the bulk of the four parts of the plan that we're going to focus on in this session. I know a priest um, from Peoria, Illinois, who used to be the vocation director. Now he's at the seminary. You know Monsignor Rolfs at, uh, yeah, well, Monsignor Rolfs, he's at, uh, in Minnesota. Now he's a, a spiritual director up there. Well, he told me one day, he used to be rector of Mount St. Mary's Seminary. He told me when he was vocation director, he would visit all the schools. And he came up with a rule of thumb, and it was this. He said, when I visited an elementary classroom, I wanted the students to feel something good about priesthood or religious life. When I went to a middle school classroom, I wanted the students to think something good about priesthood or religious life. When I went to high school classrooms, then I wanted the students to do something good, to discern priesthood or religious life, right? So if when you're a kid, you just want a good feeling. If you get a little older, you need to start thinking. When you get even older than that, you need to start doing some stuff. As a friend of mine, uh, a priest friend of mine says, uh, God can't drive a parked car, so move. <laughs> okay. One of the biggest parts of the plan is the introduction of vocation lessons, which is a curriculum supplement. And if you got that blue folder that's on the back, um, you know a little bit about this. Um, I'm going to explain what this is and why this is important. The curriculum supplement is for both schools and faith formation. There's, there are two versions of it when you log in to the website. Okay, Do you see this little login up here? That's where you log in. There's just a little code. I'll give you the code in a second. But the goals of this curriculum are Help students understand that holiness is the first vocation, to thoroughly understand each vocation. Have the tools to discern later in life. This should be ringing a bell. These are our, our main goals, right? Um, so the idea is to systematically teach kids at every age level in a way that makes sense for them. And our, our kind of our motto as we were developing this was moving from education to formation. And what does that mean? Okay, I went, I had, I went to CCD in the 1980s, okay? And I'll be honest, it was not very inspiring, okay? I mean, I think I learned about the priesthood. It was like, um, holy orders is one of the seven sacraments. And it was like this very dry thing that did not capture the imagination of a young Sam. <laughs> um, so the idea is, just like if you were teaching a, a child to write, would you make the child um, you know, copy out uh, the pages of a book? No. They wouldn't learn how to write. They'd learn how to copy. Okay, Just like you wouldn't... Uh, Teach a kid to pray just by saying memorized prayers. Teach them to open their heart, speak to God in their own voice, okay? The same thing is true when you're talking about vocations. It's, you can't just let this be rote memorization, boring facts. Holy orders is one of the seven sacraments. You can't do that. You have to engage them, right? Make it interesting, inspiring. And that's what Vocation correct, uh, Lessons does. It has content like that to capture the imagination. So some, some examples of achieving this. Girl sees sister praying at church. Hi, sister. She says, well, I don't know if I'm called to that, but I understand what she's doing with her life, and that's awesome. 
right? She understands that. She appreciates it, right? The boy sees the, sees the priest. He says, you know, I don't know if I'm called, but I respect the power of the priesthood. That's, what you, that's where you want to end up with this. Okay, just quickly over the structure. It's one unit per grade. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right now going to talk about the school's version. Okay, the school's version takes one week of religion classes. The religious ed version is one Sunday. You could stretch it to two if you want. Um, every grade, six elements. Lesson of marriage, priesthood, religious life. And then how to listen. There's also an assessment and what we call a family feature, something to go home and talk to mom and dad about. Theoretically, right? Teachers in the room, hopefully they do this, okay? This can be taught as a one unit, or if you're busy and you can just, you know, I'm gonna fit in the lesson in, on marriage in November, and then later on in December, we're gonna do priesthood. You can do it that way too. They're standalone lessons. And this is a 100% online program. But when you log in, there are also printable PDFs. So if you're a, a paper and pencil teacher, you can print this stuff out. And that's okay, honestly. One of the cool things, I forgot to mention this, that the students also have a login. So you can tell all your seventh graders, go log in read such and such section and do the homework, and they can do it. And it's cool, when the, the teacher logs in, you, you'll be able to toggle back and forth between the teacher view and the student view. So here's the, uh, the login information. This is also in your packets. Now I'm gonna show you a little one minute video just to give you another little flavor of this, okay? So again, if you did not pick up one of these and you are a, an educator, definitely pick one up. If you're here from your parish but your DRE could not make it, please pick one of these up. Okay, now I'm going to explain something important, okay? What we have learned over the years is that teachers are different, schools are different, and educators like options. We have learned this just it's just the honest truth. Uh, observation, not theory, as, uh, <laughs> as Father Pratt said. Okay, so in this folder, the right side of the folder has these little brochures that explain vocation lessons and have the logins. Okay, you go in depth, every single uh, grade level. The right side has some hard copy options. So there are some worksheets, 
um, that you can buy and print out, or not print out, I'm sorry, buy and, and give to your students and have them do in the classroom, okay? So the right side has a little bit easier options, quick, easy options. The right side is online and more in-depth, okay? Now, I wanna talk about one element of this because it's very important. So this is called the Learn to Discern workbook. This is for teenagers. So it's appropriate for high school level kids. And the dream here for the diocese is that confirmation students would use this booklet. And I, I'm very excited about this little thing because it has little one page articles with discussion questions that are interesting and cool and capture your imagination, but they also go deep, okay? So like there's some great stuff on marriage. For example, there's like this whole story about uh, Saints Hadrian and Natalia, or this Roman couple who have this very dramatic, tragic love story that really underscores the beauty of marriage. It's awesome, it's awesome uh, material. So the idea is that Confirmation students, before they receive that sacrament, would go through this booklet. So we're inviting all DREs to please consider that. And those who are reluctant or, oh gosh, we have our, our program um, all full, those who do it, do this, share with them how awesome it is, okay? So next year, they do it, all right? That's the idea with this. And I, I do really want to just emphasize, as we saw in that one slide about marriage, that marriage is a vocation in crisis, we need to be talking to our kids about marriage a lot. And so this, this will kind of be a foundation for that. Okay. All right. Another part of the vocation plan is to reach uh, another age group of kids, which is first communicants. Beautiful age, seven years old. My youngest is 11. I wish she was seven still sometimes. <laughs> so such a cute little age. Um, and it, this is a very uh, spiritually impressionable age, right? And so we wanna invite DREs and schools to give a book, some kind of vocation-related book to all first communicants. And the one that's suggested for 2023, this could be different books, but this is a suggested one, is this, uh, The Unsolvable Problem by Mother Claire Matias. She's a nun who um, lives in the Bronx in New York City. And she's a delightful person. She's written this really cute book that has awesome artwork that teaches kids about religious life. And I do need to mention, this is a book for girls and boys, and boys, okay? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really neat one. Do I have a sample over here? Yeah. There's some more on the table back there if you'd like to bring these home. Yes? Okay, they're gone. So one beautiful thing about these books that, that I love is that what do kids do with picture books? They ask mom and dad to read them to them, right? And so we want to bring parents into this discussion, of course. At my table at lunch with several deacons, the, the hot conversation topic at the table was we need holy Catholic families who are going to form their kids in the faith, right? This is one little arsenal. You give it to the kid, Daddy, will you read this to me at night, tonight? And if you remember having kids or maybe your grandkids, they want to read it over and over and over again. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the rationale behind this. Okay. We've shown a lot of support to the seminarians today. 
We want to make this kind of an endemic part of the rhythm of life in the diocese. And so declared January 31st, the Feast of St. John Bosco as Support Our Seminarians Day. And the idea behind this is, of course, to encourage our seminarians, right? These guys are thinking they're going to get checks back here. I can tell, right? Yeah? Okay. Um, no, it's to encourage them and pray for them. But also, the seminarians have a part to play with this too. So on this January 31st day, we want to keep our seminarians busy, maybe with the Zoom call with the confirmation class, okay? Or some sort of uh, engagement with him and the diocese, uh, a two-way communication. We also have back there, you may have seen them, they're small uh, little postcards that kids can color and write a message to the seminarian and send it to them. Um, so that's just, those are just a couple ideas. You can use your imagination and creativity to do this. Okay, let's talk about um, discernment. And this part of the plan is mainly dealing with older kids and young adults. And you're, you're asking yourself, again, you know, what is my role here? What is my role here? Oftentimes, when you plan a great event, Father Hoke knows this, when you plan a great event, put all this energy into making it wonderful, but you have to have people there, <laughs> right? You have to have people there. And so your job would be to help promote and encourage those in your parish or school to come to some of these things that we'll go through. So there's already a busy person's retreat which we've talked about this and maybe renamed to something more vocation related. This is an awesome uh, event where the diocese actually brings in some other vocation directors from other religious communities. And it's a, it's a whole uh, program of discernment for young people, typically college age folks. So that's the, the, the date is actually already on the books, October two through six. And Father, it's true that um, even if they're not part of the campus ministry, if they're college age, they could come to this. Is that? Yeah. So encourage all college age students to come to this. You will get more information about this in the coming weeks. Okay, this is a big one that we do need to talk about. The high school seminary and convent trip. Do you remember, uh, was it number six or seven on Father Pratt's uh, schema there, where you actually visit and see other discerners and you see what seminary life is like? Well, we're trying to fast forward that process a little bit by inviting a very large number of, of high school students to go to the college, to go to the seminary or the convent. So. Hopefully, this year, this bus won't be nearly as uh, enough, right? We'll need four or five of these buses, Father Hope, okay? Um, because last year, what happened was um, kids from the Catholic high schools went on this trip down to Lincoln, I think, um, to visit a, a seminary and, and a convent. But now we want to widen that to students from public schools as well. And so you DREs and, and catechists and youth ministers, um, a lot of information is going to come to you about this upcoming. And what is the beauty of this, right? What is the beauty? The beauty is it demystifies something. When they get in the environment, just like you saw in Trevor's video, it's like, man, this looks good. I like this. I could do this. That looks nice, huh? That's where I'd want my daughter to be, between two sisters, praying. <laughs> okay, Andrew and Miriam dinners. I'll just explain this um, briefly. Uh, 
Andrew Dinner is a long time practice in the U.S. church where the bishop would go to a local parish, for example, and invite uh, pastors from around that area to bring young men to a dinner. Um, and then bishop will speak, pastor would share a vocation story, uh, etc. And the Miriam dinner would be similar, but for women with other religious women there. Um, th this uh, upcoming school year, these are actually going to be on campus in Kearney and Shadron, I believe. Um, details are still being worked out exactly when those are going to happen. Um, but this is a wonderful thing. I did this when I was a... Uh, right before I became a seminarian. And I'll tell you the thing that stood out to me the most was, like, I had seen Father Alan McDonald at parish at my, my own parish, and I'd seen Father Jim Costigan at this other parish, but they weren't connected to me, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, they were like, you know, punching each other's arms and, like, interacting and had some fraternity. I was like, man okay, this is a cool, you know, this is a good thing, right? So get the priests together with young men. Okay, and then next one, discernment groups. Um, again, it's best to discern together with other like-minded people. Father Pratt, um, this tonight... Uh, we're going to meet, and Father Pratt is very, very good at discernment groups. He's run many uh, discernment groups. He has a really cool program for how the students can actually run it themselves to some degree. Um, and it's, it's great, like really. Like these guys get together, they have fun together, they eat together, they pray together. Um, like one of my favorite parts is your no man left behind so he, he, let's say you have like eight guys in the group. Each one gets a role in the, in the discernment group. And there's one that's called the no man left behind guy. That means if somebody misses the meeting, it's your job. You have to call him and tell him everything that happened at the meeting. We're not going to let no man left behind. You got to know what happened, right? Um, so it's like a tight knit band of brothers type uh, effect. So... Father Pratt's going to talk about that with us, some, a smaller group this evening. Um, we're going to work to have vocation themes uh, for summer events. That's already happened this summer, and we'll continue. Um, oh, I, yeah, I put this in here, too. This is kind of cool. This isn't really part of the vocation plan, but I just want to let you know about this, is... Um, if you do a VBS, you DREs, if you do a VBS, this is cool because it's a vocation Bible school, right? A vocation Bible school. And you see these little cutouts. Uh, I think Bob Campney had brought some that are out in the lobby too. But it's a whole five-day VBS program, and it's really cool and fun. So, and this lady, she's from Minnesota. Um, she helped develop this. She's got a lot of energy. Kids love it. So, and it's uh, to learn more about that, it's vocationbibleschool.com. Okay. We are going to have a time for question and answers in just a second, too. I'm just going to go over a few more things. Okay. Inspiration slash communication. Um, <clears throat> we already talked about the great job that the diocese did with the recent magazine. Um, but Angie and Greg and others in the chancery, um, it's top of mind for them that the diocese is, has a new initiative and there's going to be a lot of communications about vocations in the coming weeks, months, years. Um, two things I want you all to pay attention to is we want to put a lot of effort into National Vocation Awareness Week. You're going to get a packet. Uh, parishes will get a packet to help celebrate this. So it's November 6th, 12th. And also, 
You guys do know that we're in the, we've just started a Eucharistic revival, three years, all, every uh, parish in America. Um, so that's going to tie into Vocation Awareness Week. Importantly, this is the week that you would choose to teach vocations in a Catholic school. So the vocation curriculum, uh, the seventh is a Monday, that's when you'd start teaching it. Okay, and then World Day of Prayer for Vocations. As Bob Campney said at, at lunchtime today, when people walk into the church, they better know that this is what the day is, right? We are praying for vocations today. I'll, t I'll confess that I, I always thought this was like a weird title. Because it's like, we're only going to pray for vocations one day, right? That seems odd. Well, the way I look at it is it's the day that you launch new prayer programs. So, for example, if you were launching the vocations crucifix, launch it on this day, right? Okay. Um, okay, so those are the main elements of the vocation plan. You are gonna get communiques about this uh, going forward. You guys are from you know, play many different roles in your parish. And I want to emphasize that sometimes it's good to have other people in your parish in a formal group. If you don't have a Sarah Club, sometimes it's good to have a parish vocation ministry or team. And I think just by virtue of you being here today, you should feel deputized to go back and start that, okay? I hereby commission you. <laughs> I don't really have that authority, but I'm encouraging you, okay, to go back and do that in your parish. Um, because if you wait for Father to do it, or you wait for somebody else to do it, if it's everybody's responsibility, then it's nobody's responsibility, right? So take the ball and run with it. Or ask a friend. If you don't feel that outspoken, ask a friend to help you or something. But take the initiative to start a parish vocation committee. Just a few, um, before we get into Q&A, just a few uh, recommendations for this. One or two leaders. Um, there's a book called Hundredfold, which some of you, I think, know about. Rhonda Grunewald had come to the diocese before to do a, a workshop. It's a, it's a whole little handbook on how to have a parish vocation committee. Meet with your pastor, talk about plans, collaborate with them. Plan realistic projects, not these gigantic things. Well, if every single family would do this, well, every single family is not going to do that, okay? Whatever it is, except for eat. Um, so be realistic. I said coordinate efforts around annual events. And then, this is kind of important. <clears throat> when you're choosing what to do in your parish, if there's a choice between hand out some brochures or spend 30 minutes in the third grade classroom, do the thing in the classroom. Prioritize people to people stuff instead of just information stuff. Talk with people, learn about them. So, okay. Last thing, remember the four eyes of vocation ministry. This is something that my friend, Father Brett Brannon, developed, and I'm going to mention it to you because I think it's an awesome little framework as you're going forward. The four eyes. The first one is inspiration. Are you really inspiring kids? to love the Lord Jesus, and to dedicate their lives to him. Two, good information. If you don't have good information, 
you're likely to ha make a bad decision, right? That's why we tell uh, uh, young men who are discerning the priesthood, um, don't discern what you think the priesthood is, right? Discern what it actually is. So there's a book called To Save a Thousand Souls. There's Priests for the Third Millennium. Um, young men need good information, right? And young women as well. Invitation. I think Father Pratt's going to talk about that this afternoon a little bit more. Your invitation is huge. If you're a priest, if you're a deacon, but even if you're just a teacher, and especially if you're a dad or mom, inviting your kids to consider a priestly or religious vocation. The fourth eye is intimacy of, with Jesus. So, you know, what I tell little kids sometimes at the VBS, I said, why doesn't, why doesn't God just text you your vocation or call your mom's phone? And I get one of the kids to come up here and I'll, they'll stand right here and I'll, I'll do a stage whisper and I'll say, I love you. And that, I'll do it to where he can hear it really well but the other kids can't hear it as well. I say, why did I do that, right? Why did I do that? Because I first want you to be close to me before I tell you my, your vocation, right? Jesus wants intimacy first, right? Communion and intimacy first. Then he can whisper, be a priest, or whatever it is. And then the apostrophe S is service. So uh, if, a, like Father Pratt said, if a kid's just sitting at home, only cyber discerning, or only reading the catechism, which I don't know many kids that do that, but uh, if they're only, if it's not active, it's not happening, right? So getting kids to serve is huge because then they get outside of themselves. They see what, how good it is to give of themselves to others. Okay. The three eyes of vocation ministry there. 